When I talk to my clients, they often tell me they are overwhelmed by the amount of metrics and dimensions that Google Analytics 4 has. There are hundreds of options, but in reality, you only need to know a handful of them to use GA4 to get insights, and the rest will just distract you and waste your time. So in this video, I'll explain the most useful metrics and dimensions in GA4 in about 20 minutes. There are 26 metrics and 16 dimensions, ranging from user metrics to revenue and engagement metrics. So I I made a two page summary, which you can download it by clicking on the first link in the description if you don't have time to go through the whole video. <laughs> Hello, data people. I'm Robert from Clicks.Lie, and I'm here to help you understand and analyze data to make better decisions in e commerce. So, let me first explain the difference between metrics and dimensions. Dimensions provide context and describe what you are measuring. They are usually displayed as text, although they could also be numbers, but GA4 cannot really count them together. On the other hand, metrics quantify the data and tell you how much or how often something is happening. They are always shown as numbers that GA4 can also count. For example, here's the acquisition report in GA4 and you can see that on the left you have dimensions and on the right you have the metrics, which are all numeric. You can clearly see that dimensions are and the what you're measuring and metrics are the how many or how much part of your data. So let's start with users, sessions, and page views, because those kind of appear everywhere and they're kind of linked together. So let's say it's day one and you come to a website. You visit that website and you do your things and you leave it. That means in your analytics, you'll be counted as one user and one session. Then the next day, you come to the same website again. Now your web analytics would say you're still one user, but you had two sessions. And then the third day, same thing. You're still one user, but you had three sessions. So basically, user is just kind of grouping sessions together. So in theory, you have only one user, but multiple sessions. Now, in practice, this doesn't really happen because we are kind of starting to have less and less reliable data when it comes to users, just because uh, it uses technology called cookies and uh, browser cookies are just kind of dying out slowly. So uh, actually, I prefer to use sessions wherever I look at any data, but users are still there. Oh yeah, and one more thing about sessions is that it expires after 30 minutes of inactivity. So for example, if you leave your website open for an hour or so, go away from your computer, come back and start using the website again, you'll st still be counted as two sessions just because there's that 30 minute window. However, if you're using actively the website for an hour, then it, it counts you as a session, one session. So there's no worries about it. Then uh, I mentioned that page views are kind of also related to this. So let's take a look at sessions and page views. And let's say you come to a website and then you go to three different pages. This means you'll be counted as one session and you have three page views. On top of that, you have a metric or a dimension called a landing page. I wanna just bring it up here because it kind of makes sense here. Uh, you see that, that the page that you visited first becomes your landing page. So for example, if you go to a website, you visit the home, then you visit the product page, and then you go to the cart, you are counted as, uh, in the landing page report, you'll be counted as one home visit. However, if you go to pages and screens report, you'll be counted as three different pages. So one for homepage, one for product page, and one for cart. So landing page is your first page of your session. So then if we look at other user related metrics, we have events. Basically in GA4, every action is an event or could be an event. Uh, user interactions on your site or app can include page views, clicks, form submissions, video play, scroll depth, time on page, and so on. There's just so many of them and you could create your own if you want to. And then you have the returning user. Basically, those are the people that return to your site. So it's not their first visit, but it's a uh, second or more. Uh, however, this is pretty unreliable nowadays just because it's also based on cookies, uh, which are going away. So I would really avoid using it uh, right now. And the same thing goes for new users, which is basically users that uh, are the first time on your website. Again, not so reliable just because browser cookies expire on Safari in seven days. So it's not that that useful. And then you have active users and this is any user who has engaged session. You'll see active user used in some of the reports. If you're, you know, if you're ever wondering, it just means that. Well, you might be wondering, well, well what's engaged session? Well, that's what we're going to look at next is engagement metrics. And these uh, basically start with engaged session. An engaged session is basically a session that lasts longer than 10 seconds or has a conversion event. 
or two or more screen views or page views, basic. Now, I want to really point out that this 10 seconds, this is a very short time and you can adjust that. You can increase it to 60 seconds if you want to. And I actually advise that you increase it at least to 40, 50 seconds, just because otherwise, imagine somebody lands on your website and 10 seconds, let's say for after 11 seconds, they do nothing. They just close the tab. They are counted as engaged session. And I, I don't think that is the truth. So that's why I would increase it to 30, 40. That way, at least you increase the likelihood they've done something on their site as well. And this is pretty easy to add. It's just a few clicks in, in the admin section and you can get it uh, changed. And if you want to learn how to do that, there'll be a video here in top right corner. You can click on that banner and it'll take you to uh, the right tutorial. Okay, then you have average engagement time. It kind of describes what it is. It measures average time users spend on your site. And the higher time uh, just indicates that people are more interested in your content, especially if it's an article. The longer time they spend on it, the more they're kind of engaged with it. You could also try to calculate the average time people uh, would take to read the whole article and then look at this average engagement time. If it's close to that, you know, time that people would read, then you can assume oh, more and more people are actually reading through almost whole article. And then you have engagement rate, which is percentage of engaged sessions uh, out of all your sessions. So uh, the higher, the better it is. But as I mentioned, you need to adjust that engaged session. Otherwise, this is a little bit, a little bit too good to be true. I'll definitely in uh, increase that from 10 seconds to high, uh, more than 40 seconds. Then you can get a bit more, that way you can get a bit of more truthful um, picture of your engagement on your site. And then in the old Google Analytics, we used to have bounce rate and it's again appearing in the GA4. And basically this is the percentage of non-engaged sessions and it's the opposite of engagement rate. So the higher rate means users are leaving your site without engaging with any of your content. So let me show you a few examples. Here's a report. This is the uh, traffic acquisition report. Uh, and we see all these metrics are here. You have the user sessions, engage sessions, and so on. There are a few metrics that really you don't need. If you have the rights, there's a little pen icon here. You can adjust what you see in this report. And I would actually advise you to delete anything you never use just because it, it's there and it creates a bit more distractions and there's no reason for it to be there. And as I mentioned before, you can grab the two page summary with all of the metrics and dimensions I talk about in this video by clicking on the first link in the video description. Next, let's take a look at purchase metrics. And this is where we start with is the purchase event, just because it appears in many reports. I want you to get more familiar with events. And this basically just, this event happens or fires whenever user completes a purchase. So whenever they go to a thank you page, uh, that's when this is tracked. It just tells GA4, hey, this purchase event, it happened, so count it as one. Then let's take a look at total revenue. And in this case, this takes into account revenue from websites, in-app, subscriptions, advertisements, and then minus refunds, you can see here. Now, why do we have in-app and subscriptions? Just because GA4 is able to, uh, you can uh, connect it to not only your website, but also your apps and uh, you know advertisements and so on. But in your case, it's probably just the website. Then we have purchase revenue, which kind of sounds similar to what we just had. But in this case, it's the website plus in-app purchase and that's it. There's no refund in included. Then we have the third one that sounds similar and it's the gross purchase revenue. And in this case, it's revenue from website plus app, excluding tax and shipping. And then there's actually a fourth one where we're going to get to that in a second. It's the item purchase revenue. So we're going to get to that in a second. Purchase conversion rate is super important metric in GA4, which doesn't exist. This is totally crazy that it, they didn't include this. Purchase conversion rate uh, takes into account purchases and sessions and you're going to get a rate, uh, you know, a percentage of how many people uh, came to your website and uh, how many turned to customers. And this is really important metric for any e-commerce website or actually any website that's selling anything. So to actually add this to your GA4, you need to use something called calculated metric. It's pretty simple. You do it in your admin panel in GA4, takes about three minutes to set up. And if you want to learn how to do that, you can just click here in the top right corner. There's a banner. It'll take you to that tutorial. Next one, we have ARPPU, so average revenue per paying user. And this is kind of similar to average order value, if you've heard that, of that term before. And it's total purchase revenue divided by paying users. So you'll know uh, people that buy, uh, on average, how much they buy with. So what, what is the average order value? By default, this doesn't appear anywhere, but you can always add it to your reports. 
Then we have average purchase revenue per user, and it's similar to average order value, but in this case, we're looking at all the users, not only those that bought, but all the users. So we're looking at total purchase revenue divided by, well, all users, it should say. And actually, if you look at e-commerce, this is a value that combines average order value and conversion rate. You can see it here. And why is it important? Well, sometimes you improve your website and you increase conversion rate, but then you decrease your average order value. So is it better for your website or not? Well, average purchase revenue would tell you that. And it's really important overall metric to track on your website because you, you want to not only uh, convert more people, but you also want to sell with higher uh, average order. Then we have order coupon, and this simply tracks the promo, promo or coupon codes used with your purchase uh, and how many times it's used and so on. So if you take a look at the revenue metrics, if you come to monetization and here an overview, for example, you can see total revenue, purchase revenue. In most shops, it's going to be the same uh, unless you've implemented refund and you have a lot of refunds, then maybe there's some differences there. Then what else is here? You have the average purchase revenue per user. And again, you could customize more things here so that you can see more stuff than just this because some of these are not really useful or they don't show any data. So you could just swap with, swap them with something more useful. Next, we take a look at item metrics and items just mean products in GA4. So let's take a look at them. So first of all, we have items viewed. So number of times items is viewed on product page. You can see this is really on product page only. So if you have this product on your homepage, it would not track it uh, as part of this event. I, and then we have items added to cart. And this is and this just counts how many times uh, a specific product has been added to cart. Now, one thing, this counts on any page. So even if you have add to cart on product page, uh, you have on homepage, maybe on lister page, maybe in your cart as well, it will always count those add to carts. As long as you've set up the tracking for all of those different pages, it will uh, count them in the GA4 dashboard. Then we have items purchased, and this really kind of explains itself in the name, but uh, different from other revenue metrics as it's per item, so it's per product. Then we have item revenue and total revenue. And the difference is just that the revenue, uh, the item revenue is from individual items or for individual items. And the total revenue is for the all of them together, right? And unfortunately, you can't always combine item metrics with total metrics. So if you are, you're looking at item name with uh, how many times it's been added to a cart, you're not, probably not going to be able to add the total revenue to each of those items because it, it, GA4 is not able to count that. That's why you need to pair the item metrics with item dimensions, which we're going to kind of cover a bit later as well in this video. Then we have items viewed in list, and this is just the number of times items are viewed on a lister page. So the list is same as lister page in GA4. However, I've seen many of my clients tracking this really badly just because it's pretty hard to track correctly. So let's let me show you an example. Why is it so hard? So so here I have a lister page and I have some products here. And if I start scrolling, let's say I'm scrolling and scrolling and I see this hoodie. Now, in a perfect world, every time a new product comes into view, that's sent to GA4 as a item list view. But in reality, most companies do not do that. So whenever you load this page, it actually just says, ah, all of these products that are on this page, okay, let's send all those products to GA4 as they've been viewed on in the list. And you can see that that's going to create very skewed numbers, especially for products that are a little bit lower on the page, because a lot of people will never see this hoodie, but still it's been tracked as if it has been viewed. And this will just give you skewed numbers and you can't trust them in this case. So if you do this implementation, if you have any influence, then make sure that anytime the product shows up, only then you fire that event. Then we also have items list click, and this is number of times items are clicked on a lister page. So that's pretty simple to track. Then we have custom metrics. I just want to uh, mention that you can create this yourself. However, this is not the most used feature in J4 and uh, most people would use the custom dimension over a custom metrics. I'm going to get to that in a second. And uh, as an example, you, uh, for custom metrics, you could use something like count form submissions. But again, most of my clients use custom dimensions. And speaking of dimensions, let's dive into these guys because 
this is where it gets a little bit more interesting because you can really customize these. Let's start by discussing two types of dimensions. There's the session and then there's the first user. The session shows data specific to that session, whereas first user shows data of the user's first time on your site. So again, if the person comes many times on your site uh, in sessions, it will just show you the latest sessions uh, information, whereas with first user, it will always show whatever happened in the first session. I hope that makes sense. So personally, I prefer to use sessions just because it, it's more reliable. And uh, first user, it's just, it uses cookies as the technology. And as I've already mentioned, it's not very reliable. So stick to sessions if it's possible. Let's talk about default channel groupings because they just appear everywhere in the GA4. And it means just default grouping of traffic channels. It's something that uh, Google created. And then uh, these are the default ones. You can create also custom channel grouping. It's totally possible. And a lot of bigger companies have uh, things like that just because uh, sometimes the way GA4 is grouping certain uh, sources, they're not the way your company is uh, treating them. So if you want an example of default channel groupings, you have organic, paid, affiliate, and email, and so on. And these are based on UTM parameters. And if you don't know what UTM parameters parameters are, they're just some uh, parameters in the URL. Like here we have, this is my, this is my GA4 for e-commerce course URL. And then here we have, this is the main part of the URL. And then we have parameters here, UTM source, UTM medium, and UTM campaign. So these are the UTM parameters. And if you want to learn how to use UTM parameters, because they're really important, especially if you're running any type of campaigns, be that ads or email, you need to know how to use this so that you can then track uh, whatever is happening. So if you want to learn how to use this with a free tool, uh, then you just click on the top right corner. There's a banner and uh, it will take you to a tutorial. Then we have a dimension called source, and it's basically the origin of traffic. So specific websites or platforms. Uh, examples can be Google, Facebook, TikTok, uh, could be just newsletter, buzzfeed.com. It depends where they're coming from. Then we have medium, and uh, this is general category of the source. So uh, in this case, uh, the examples are organic, uh, uh, CPC, referral, email, video, and so on. There can be a lot of different sources as well. Then we have campaign. This is something used to identify your marketing campaigns uh, when you're driving traffic to your website. Uh, you set these yourself in the UTM parameters. So that's why it's important to understand how UTM parameters work so you can track your campaigns. Uh, campaign uh, also have uh, things like UTM terms and UTM content, uh, but you learn more about that if you check out my video about UTMs. Then we have a dimension called landing page. I already mentioned that the landing page is the first page uh, seen in a session. And it's really important for entry points, uh, but landing page just shows you URLs of uh, pages. So if we go to a landing page report, which I have open here, you can see here, these pages people come to as their first page in their journey. Then we have page path and page path is the URL of the page. Again, we see here landing page, but it's these are page paths as well. And then we have page title and page title is not the same as your heading. So for example, if I come on this website, uh, the heading is men's, uh, men's slash unisex, whereas the title of this page, if you hover over the tab here in the top, you can see it shows men's slash unisex, and then you have Google Merch Shop. That's the page title. Now, personally, I like to use page path over page title because sometimes the titles are not so clear and you might have similar page titles on different pages. Whereas with the page path, you will always know the URL. And then you have content groups and group this groups pages together for easier analysis. And this is a custom setup. You need to set up this uh, by yourself. However, if you do it, it's super useful because you can basically group uh, types of pages together. For example, all the product pages would show up as just PDPs or you can group all your articles or SEO articles and call them articles. And then you can see the uh, you can see data for all of them together. And for e-commerce websites, it's really easy to have these uh, by page type. And that way you can compare different page types to each other. 
but you could also group contents by other. For example, if you have a lot of articles, you can group them by, I don't know, uh, sales related uh, articles. Then you have a bit more like content heavy, or maybe you have also membership uh, articles. You could group those pages and then you can compare them to each other. Which one is actually bringing you the money? Which ones are bringing most views and so on? And then I want to mention event name. Uh, this just describes the names of the events on your website. Uh, however, this is useful when you're creating funnels, filters, or segments. So if you want to uh, look only at people that purchased, then you can uh, set in the filters, hey, I just want to see uh, people with event name equals purchase. I uh, just wanted to mention because of that. Then we have item name, and this is just basically the product name. And we have item ID, which is the product uh, ID, or in most cases, if you're in e-commerce, it will be the product SKU number. And in many companies, it's easier to look at the SKU number than just the product names, just because the names sometimes are similar for different variants. Then we have the item category, and this is just the uh, kind of overall categories for the product. So for example, if you have, a, I don't know, let's say you're looking at a running shoe for men, that's probably uh, the category will be men's shoes or something like that. Then you have item list name, and this is just the name of the lister page where the item was viewed or clicked. Uh, so kind of straightforward as well. And you have the search term. This is really important because you can actually see what people search on your website if you have that functionality, but this is only on your website. So it's not what uh, people search on Google. It's really just in your internal search uh, like we have here. If I would search in this anything like hoodie, it would appear in GA4 as a hoodie, and uh, this is the internal search. And then we have device category, and this is where you can split your traffic by mobile, desktop, and tablet. I just want to mention this one so that you know how it's called. Just because when you're analyzing data, there's a big difference between the behavior, user behavior on mobile and desktop. And then we come to the custom dimensions uh, because you can set uh, set custom dimensions in GA4 and you can really you tailor them for your business so that it you can really dig deeper into insights. So for example, you could add something like login status. So are they logged in or not? Uh, customer number. Uh, this is a number that you assign to them when they log in and advanced attribution if you have anything. So, so the options are limitless, but really this helps you to uh, make GA4 data even better by enriching it with data from, for example, from your e-commerce platform. If you're interested in creating custom dimensions or custom tracking for your company, but you don't want to do it yourself, you can book a call with us and we can discuss whether we can help you with that. The link will be in the description. Now you know the most important metrics and dimensions in GA4, but about half of the GA4 reports are useless and using them will waste your time. That's why you should watch this video next to learn the most useful reports in GA4 specifically for e-commerce.